Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In our series on the Qasida Burda, we're on poem 127. Allah Busiri says, Humul Jibalu Fasal Anhum Musadimahum, Mada Ra'a Minhum Fi Kulli Mustadimi, Wasal Hunain and Wasal Badran, Wasal Uhudan, Fusulu Hatfin Lahum Adha Min Al Wahami, Al Musdiri Al Bay Al Musdiri Al Bida Humran, Badama Waradat Min Al Ida Kulla Muswedim Min Al Limami. Well, Katibina be Sumril Hatima Tarakat, Akla Muhum Harfa Jismin Gayra Munajimi Shakis Silla Hilahum, Sima Tamay Yuzuhum, while Wardu Yamtazu be Sima Anis Salami, and so on, and he continues. What he's saying in these is again, this is a description of their valor, and he does that for a number of poems. He's Speaking about it from a number of different angles, he's providing a focused look on the different aspects. So in this one, he's talking about mountains, humul jibal. Now for Arabs to speak about mountains is very significant because mountains have been mentioned a number of times in the Quran. One is to speak about the mountains themselves, but they've also been spoken about in the Quran <coughs> To show the strength, the might, and the greatness of something. Because if you look around Makkah Mukarrama, the mightiest thing that you saw was a mountain. That was some of the biggest, heftiest, unmovable mountains. So that's why when the Prophet ﷺ would speak about the blasting of the trumpet, وَنُفِخَ فِي sur. And the day of judgment coming in the form of the blast of a trumpet. The people of Makkah used to say, we'll just hide behind a mountain. Because for them, mountain was so massive, was such a great thing. Because, you know, their houses were small at that time. So scale-wise, what's a mountain? You know, it's massive. Today, our buildings are bigger than mountains sometimes. So... We're really, in terms of the fitra of how the earth is supposed to be, we're really disoriented as to what's big and what's small. You know, we've really confused. It's all relative for us. But for them, we'll just hide behind the mountain. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْجِبَالِ They ask you about the mountains. فَقُلْ يَنْسِفُهَا رَبِّي نَسْفَ Then just say that my Lord will blow them to dust. Tamurru marra sahab. You'll see them just blowing around like the clouds. Haba manthura. It'll become nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the mountains. He really attacks the mountains because that was the mightiest thing in their mind at that time. So here he's calling the sahaba mountains. Humul jibal. They are the mountains. Fasal anhum musadimahum. Ask those who collided with them. Ask their opponents what they saw in them on every field of honor. Mada ra'a minhum fi kulli mustadimi. Now, in terms of that, musadimahum musadim means the person who sadama means to attack something, to bang against something. That's what sadama means. Sadmatun. It means an attack. It means Something that will affect you in a way. And physically, it's, it's normal, a physical attack on something. A shock of some sort. Now, Saddam Hussein was, mashallah, someone who did that a lot. Because his name was from Sadama, from the same root term. So that's what he was doing. He was, he was willing to shock and awe and uh, attack things. Because Saddam is a, a mubalagha. It's an exaggerated form of that term. Anyway, khair, that's a different issue. But here he's saying, فَسَلْ عَنْهُمْ مُصَادِمَهُمْ Those people who they used to fight with, that they used to attack, that were their foes, their opponents, ask them. Why would you ever ask an enemy? Enemy is never going to tell the truth. An enemy will always make it insignificant, make something valued insignificant about you. You will always use that moment to criticize, to put down, to humiliate. 
But here that there's a challenge. Ask their, ask their opponents. Ask their opponents as well. Now the opponents, only if it was something undeniable that was clear in his perception. Because for me to be considered to be an honest individual, and I'm given the option to criticize my opponent, I have to be very careful how I do that. Because if I criticize them with something that is not true about them, then I will be put down because there's people who will judge what I say. So I'm given an option and I have to try to be very clever in terms of how I tell the truth or I don't tell a lie and I still put them down. Do you understand? That's why if you look at Abu Sufyan, this was the challenge that he had when he went to Elia, which is Jerusalem, during time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he was asked by Heraclius, the leader of the Romans at the time, I've received this letter. Heraclius had received the letter from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then he'd asked his people to look if he saw, if they saw anybody from Mecca. And Abu Sufyan was around there at the time in a trade caravan. So they brought him to the king, uh, to the ruler, to the, 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 the leader. And he asked them, okay, what do you think of these people? So he, Abu Sufyan says, I had to be very careful. I had to be very careful. And he says, there was only one place where I could slip in something that was even slightly negative. So he had to tell the truth. You, however, the only, the only place where you have to tell the truth is where you're going to get caught out otherwise. So it has to be something that's evident and clear. That would, that would make you look like a fool if you told a lie about it. So that's why what he's trying to say by all of this is that their valor, their bravery, their strength and everything was so obvious that even their enemies would have to tell the truth because otherwise it would take down the integrity of their enemies as well. And if there's poems in Arabic that says, وَالْحَقُّ مَا شَهِدَتْ بِهِ الْأَعْدَاءُ That the truth is that which is given is, is, uh, is borne witness to by the enemy. If the enemy says something praiseworthy about you, then that is the truth. Because friends will always praise you, but if your enemies can also praise you, that look, in, in this sense, I have to say that he, he or she is like this, or he is like this. There's been politicians who've used different ways of trying to get higher appeal for themselves. One of the recent leaders of France, he used to have a very interesting way of praising his opponents and still getting a higher ranking. That was his tact. He would praise his opponents, uh, the competition, and he would still come out better than his opponents in that. It's just the way he did these things. So this is the human ability that Allah gives to people to use in different ways. Now, the way uh, mountains are very firm and they don't move, they're not known to be shaky. That's another comparison that he's saying, Humul Jibal, they stand firm, they don't move in the, in the face of any enemy. It doesn't, make a, uh, it doesn't make a difference in assisting the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing the task at hand. This is what they do in the places of war. That's what they do. They have this immense amount of rusukh and thabat. They will not run away. They've never been known to run away. And they've never been known to shake. There's one example in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ وَإِن كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ Their makr, their deception, their deceit, their planning, their plotting was so bad, it was so heavy, so deceptive, so intense that it could have Mountains could have been swept away by it. Mountains will never be swept away by it. But it's just to show that this is how bad it was. That if it was a force, it would take away the mountains as well. <coughs> this is talking about the makar of the disbelievers. وَإِن كَانَ مَكْرُهُمْ لِتَزُولَ مِنْهُ الْجِبَالِ So again, the play is on the jibal. Again, the play is on the jibal, on the mountain. The mountain was such an important aspect for them. So it was used in all different senses. 
that oh their deception, their plotting, their makr is so um, their deceit is so strong that it would even take away it would even take away mountains. So here he's obviously using it positively, humul jibal, that they are the mountains. Then he carries on and he says, Wasal Hunainan, Wasal Badran, Wasal Uhudan. So just in case somebody says this is just an empty argument, an empty claim. What is the proof of this? So he says the proof of it is ask Hunayn, ask Badr, ask Uhud. Now you can't ask these places, they don't speak. But again, this is poetry. This is to create in the mind that, okay, go and look at the history of Hunayn and the Badr and the Uhud. And these were some of the greatest battles that were fought with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then he says, Fusul hatfin. To really rub it in, to really make it more impactful, he says, Fusul hatfin. Now, hatf means death. Hatf means a place of death. Fusul is the plural of fasl, which means season. These were seasons of death. These were seasons of death for them. So, this is not just talking about a day or one night, this is talking about an entire season, he's calling it. Fusulu hatfin lahum adha min al wakhami, and adha means more deadly than a plague. These were seasons of death that were coming upon them that were more deadly than the plague. Now, one way to maybe understand this is when you've been for centuries on a certain belief system. Yes, you've got the ups and downs, you have instability because that whole area had a lot of instability at a micro level, in the sense that tribes fighting with each other, but that, that was their way of life, they were quite used to that. Of course it brought difficulties and so on, there was people being killed and they used to go around with their swords and so on. So all of that was there, but that was something they were used to. But then what happens is now somebody's challenging what their forefathers have been believing for many, many centuries. That makes it very difficult, especially in a time when everybody seems to believe the same thing. Because if you look at it, there was the tribal system was so intense and so close-knit that when the leader of Aus or Khazraj would become Muslim, the entire tribe would become Muslim. They wouldn't necessarily think for themselves. They think, and that's why Anas ala dini mulukihim. People are on the deen of their leaders. Now, Although today that seems to be maybe a bit difficult to comprehend, there's no doubt there is still an effect of the leadership on even us. We think differently. Yes, we protest about certain things we disagree with, no doubt about that. There's a lot of people that protest. But the way we generally act and the way we will carry ourselves when we go to another country, for example, it will be clear that this guy is a Westerner. Or the way the British Raj subjects would say, this, this person is a Britisher, right? Or a, a commoner, sir, sir, you know, they, they, when you know somebody saying, sir, okay, sir, then you know that they're not from England, because nobody says, sir, here, you know, they say that in the places that the British ruled, which is like in India and Pakistan, that's where they're going to say that. So, you, these kind of things, they come about. Once I was in the Haram. And I met a friend of mine from America, two friends from America. And uh, one of them said, you know, Makkah and Medina Munawwara, these uh, holy sanctuaries, they should not be run by the Saudis, they should not be uh, ruled by the Saudis, they should be international, internationally ruled by the Muslim countries of the world and they should all have a say and this, that and the other, whoever wants to move in. And I'm like, yeah, you're speaking like an American. You know, you're speaking like an American. I mean, come on, you know. We've already got, you know, alhamdulillah, there's some stability there. You want the Muslim world to look after Makkah, Mukarram. I mean, what's going to happen, man? Today is going to be, you know, uh, today it's going to be Salafi, tomorrow is going to be Sufi, the next day is going to be something else. Today this is going to be prohibited, that's going to be permissible. At least there's a, you know, with all that's going, alhamdulillah, at least there's some kind of peace down there. But this is... And he was like honest, like he was sitting there, I remember this was in the haram I believe, uh, in the mataf, and he said this to me. You know, he said this like so earnestly that the, this should be run by Muslims in general. So that we were naturally affected. Now, but before this was, people would just blindly take on what their, 
And that was the whole thing. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran speaks much about this. That make sure you stand up for the truth even if it's against your own close one. Because in those days it was just like my brother got into a you know, war with something over a girl or something like that. You're going to support your brother. There's no question about it. That's why the Prophet ﷺ had to say, Unsur akhaka zaliman o mazluman. Assist your brother whether he's a zalim or a mazloom. Subhanallah. Which did seem uh, to play on the other side. But the Prophet ﷺ clarified that, you know, this means that you have to help your brother when he's a zalim, which means you must stop him. That's helping him. Not in the traditional way that you just had to support your tribe or the tribe your tribe was affiliated to. And this was not just with the Arabs, this was with the Jewish tribes of uh, Medina Munawwara as well. You know, you had the Banu Quraidha, Banu Nadir, and uh, Banu Qaynuqa. Now, uh, they were, they used to fight against each other as allies of the Aus and Khazraj. So when the Aus and Khazraj are fighting each other, some of them were allied to the Aus and others were allied to the Khazraj, the Arab tribes. They would fight with each other, they would take each other prisoner, and then as a Jewish person, they would then pay to free them as well afterwards. So part of their fight, along with the Arabs, they would have to take prisoner, but then as from part of Jewish law, whatever it was, they would actually pay to, to release them. And this was how they used to deal with it in, the, in those times. Really different, but it was quite normal for them to do that. For us, it just seems really strange. How can you do that? It doesn't seem... Sensible, but then racism has been justified in the past, and people just thought it was quite fine to do that. It, it's just what is uh, generally the propaganda is what is really powerful. That's why trends change. That's why these things change all the time. Right now, they they're trying to say that heterosexual couples should be allowed to do civil partnerships. If homosexuals can do that, then why can't heterosexuals do that? Um, there's nobody fighting and there's nobody campaigning for the validity or the permissibility or the legality of polygamy. Even though the argument for that is much stronger than that for homosexuality. If it's allowing homosexuality, why can't one man and two women who are consenting marry each other? But the problem is that because it's not cool yet to do that, nobody's going to fight for it. And the Muslims who are probably the only ones who are kind of informally, uh, unofficially practicing it. I mean, they're, they're actually probably formally practicing it from a, from a Sharia perspective. Um, otherwise, everybody practices it from an unofficial perspective, where it's without any obligation. Two nights, three nights, ten nights, two months, you know, however you feel, unlicensed, you know. It's... But because the Muslims, they, they can't argue because right now Muslims seem to be on the defensive. But because it's not cool yet, the media's not picked it up, there's no big campaigners for it. Otherwise, it'd probably pass through in no time. If homosexuality could be passed through, right, then why not polygamy? But it's just what's cool. It's what's the trend. It's what matters, you know, to, to people at that particular time. That's what affects things. This is the way the world works. And there's certain people that just know how to manipulate those ideas because they have the media in their hands. And that's why the media is a very powerful tool to create perceptions and ideas. So all of that, Sal Hunayn and Sal Badran wa Sal Uhudan. So I was saying that these people for centuries there was one idea. All the stories that they've been hearing about from their forefathers were all about the same thing. And now suddenly there's a massive challenge to this. And things are going totally different. These gods that they revered, that was ingrained in them because their grandfathers revered them, their great-grandfathers revered them. That was the stories they'd been hearing about for, for centuries. It's very difficult. You know, you say you can't take the village out of the, you know, out of the individual. Well, how can you take this, you know, the, the feat of the Sahaba, the, the accomplishment when they embraced Abu Bakr Siddiqa to give up everything, just embrace? That was significant. We live in a very confusing world today. That's why it's very easy for somebody to become Muslim compared to at that time. There you had to give up so much to do that. Here people are just looking. They don't have anything. 
they're looking. Especially in this last century. You know, when Christianity just kind of disappeared and it's all really just agnostics. SubhanAllah, churches, hardly any attendance. Probably more foreigners in churches, uh, you know, from Africa, etc. Um, Africa and uh, Central America and these kind of places. Uh, than, than, you know, normal people, uh, uh, Brit, uh, sorry, English people. It's... So... فصول حتف لهم أدها من الوخمي. That's why these Hudain, Badr, Uhud, etc. These were really deadly seasons for them. That were more deadly than than the plague, as he mentions. Now, Badr and Uhud. Generally, people know the story. They're very famous. I'll just quickly mention the story of Hunain. This occurred after the conquest of Makkah, and there's a very uh, significant factors to this one. This also took place in Ramadan, 10 nights left for Ramadan, in the 8th year of Hijrah, pretty much immediately after the conquest of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ, he had conquered, gone into Mecca Mukarramah, and he'd overcome it. In, there's 10,000 Sahaba there at the time, 10,000 Sahaba. And after that, the people who were just waiting for Makkah, uh, to see what would happen to Makkah. Many of the tribes around the area, Islam had kind of crept into their heart, but because Makkah was still pagan, they felt they had a lot of respect for Makkah. They want to see Makkah. If Makkah falls, if Makkah goes into their hands, then that is right. Because Makkah, Allah will never allow Makkah to fall in the wrong hands. Because for them, what happened with Abraha, the, enemy, the, uh, the army of the elephants, that was very significant. For Allah to have um, killed the elephants and the entire army of Abraha with the special birds, the Ababil. So for them, that held a very high position. So now when the Prophet ﷺ walked in without much bloodshed shed whatsoever, and then everybody came, and then he says, okay, all of you are forgiven. So there were 2,000 of these people. So there were 12,000 people now in total. 12,000 people now in total. So when this happened, there's still some of the Arab tribes who still had animosity in their hearts. And they did not want the Muslims, they did not want the, the deen of Islam to be superior. So this became very difficult and a big burden on them to see this happening in Makkah Mukarramah. Because now the main city has fallen. So Hawazin, Hawazin was down south, uh, was down south. They... And the surrounding, they managed to get people together. Malik ibn Auf al-Mudari was their, was their leader. So he rallied people to do this. The Thaqif, the, the Banu Thaqif, the Thaqif tribe. Uh, the Thaqif tribe was uh, led by Abdu Yalil ibn Amr. Abdu Yalil ibn Amr. So the Thaqif, they got together with the Hawazin. Hawazin, their leader was Malik. Ibn Auf al-Mudari, Thaqif's leader was uh, Abdu Yalil ibn, ibn, ibn Amr. And then there was a number of other small, small groups of people. Until they became how many? 30,000. So you had 12,000 against 30,000. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was an impending danger from them. They were towards the south of Makkah Mukarramah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went towards them. So rather than wait for them to come and attack, he went with with the army to Hunain. That's where they came together. Now there's a part there where, which is a valley between two mountains. And the thing what happened on that day is because they never had, the Muslims never had a force so great. Because you just suddenly got these 2,000 additional people join you who would just become Muslim then. A few days ago, a few hours ago, whatever it was. And as Allah says in the Quran, أَعْجَبَتْهُمْ كَثْرَتُهُمْ In Badr, they were a small amount, overcame a large enemy. Uhud, same thing. Now in this one, they thought, 12,000, we've never had more in number. We're going to walk over these people. right? Because they're thinking in terms of one against 10 or one against 20, you know, no problem. So th their focus 
some people's focus it shifted to themselves not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is very crucial this is a big lesson for us so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the army as they're going through this valley suddenly they're attacked from both sides by the Hawazin who are expert marksmen they were really good at bow and arrow uh, firing arrows so this caused a massive disarray and a chaos within the Muslim army remember 2,000 people had just become Muslim they were in these places and suddenly they started to retreat. Oh, we just come into Islam. Look what's happening. They started to retreat. So there was a massive chaos and people began to disperse left, right and center. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on a white, uh, was on a, um, a mule, was on a mule uh, at that time. And Abu Abdul Rahman Al-Fihri, Abu Abdul Rahman Al-Fihri mentions that I was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was, um, he mentions that the Prophet ﷺ was on a horse for some reason. And he says, Abbas, his uncle, was next to him. And so was Abu Sufyan. Not Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, but Abu Sufyan ibn al Harith. This was uh, a cousin brother. Uh, Harith was the son of Abdul Muttalib. Um, and so Abu Sufyan ibn al-Harith, the Harith is the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who probably passed away before the Prophet sallallahu became a prophet because there was only four uncles left when the Prophet sallallahu became a prophet. Abbas, Hamza, radiyallahu anhum, they were the two Muslims and Abu Talib and Abu Lahab. All the others had passed away by the time he came, became a prophet, by the, by when he became 40 years of age. So this was his cousin brother. And in front of him was Ayman ibn Ummi Ayman, uh, the son of, uh, son of Ummu Ayman, the one who she's called Ummu Ayman for. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw this ajib situation, Muslims in disarray, things have d- dispersed here, left, right and center, where he, he took a handful of soil from the ground and he threw it in the direction of the enemy and he said, Shahatil Wuju. May the faces be effaced by this. So Abu Abdul Rahman, he mentions, uh, Al-Fihri, he mentions that when he did that, suddenly there was sakina, some tranquility which descended. And there's this discussion of tranquility mentioned in Surah Al-Fatih as well, that came down even in the, during the Battle of Uhud afterwards, where you're in this situation where generally people would be in disarray when things have just gone very wrong. And you have no direction. You've lost your strategy. But then suddenly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes... See, at the end of the day, a lot of this is to do with how moralized you are. How the morale is in these things. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you the morale, then less people can overcome. Because it's all about him. It's all about pushing. Uh, Because there's very few wars where everybody is killed. Until the last man. A lot of the time when... Uh, when, uh, when you just see people coming at you That's why war is all about deception It's all about uh, showing yourself out to be more mightier uh, Getting the might of this That's why when one, uh, in one of the battles in Battle of Uhud uh, When one of the Sahaba walking around uh, haughtily The Prophet said, this is the right thing to do at this time Though at other times it would be wrong to do this Because it's just the time to show your power Because that strikes into the enemy it's all about propaganda nowadays. YouTube and Facebook, that's, that's what it's about as well. You know, there's a propaganda war. So there's wars are fought, are fought at, uh, in, at various different levels. So Abu Abdul Rahman, he mentions that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he took this and then there was a sakina that came over the people so they kind of became a bit more calm. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called for the Ansar. He called for the Ansar and he told Abbas radiallahu anhu to call Aina Ashabu Shajara. Where are those people who took the bay'ah under the tree? The Ashabu Surat al-Baqarah. Abbas radiallahu anhu had a very loud voice. Sawtun Jahwari. He had a very, very loud voice. So he made an announcement without a megaphone. And it, people heard it. So people came. Once they heard this sound, and they knew Abbas radiallahu anhu, they came back and alhamdulillah, then they managed to overcome the mushrikeen, which were more than double their number. At the time, they were more than double their number. Ya'al ibn Ata, Ya'al ibn Ata, uh, he says that the children, 
of the people of the Hawaz in that fought against the Muslims on that day, the, their descendants. He says, I've heard this from them. They would say, Lam yabqa minna ahadun illa dakhala fi aynayhi dhalika turab. That soil that the Prophet ﷺ picked up and threw in their direction, every one of them said that they felt some of that going into their eyes. So in, on that side, it created that disorientation. Whereas on this, time, this side, uh, it, there was sakina and a lot of tranquility. Now in this case, you don't hear about angels coming down to fight. But in the battle of Badr, you hear about the angels coming. Uh, in Uhud, you hear about the angels. So you hear about the angels in certain battles, but not about in others. Like in Badr or Uhud, the Prophet said, look, this is Jibreel, he's come with his horse, he's ready. So, uh, battle, battle of Badr and Uhud, they are generally spoken about, so I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to speak about them today. But then after that, he carries on. And again, these are just all really high praises for the Sahaba. He says, Al Musdiriyil be the Humran Ba'dama Waradat, Min al Ida Kulla Muswaddim Min al Lamami. And this is an white swords. White swords red after their encounter with the black heads of the foemen. Black heads mean their hair is still black. So these are not old people that are fighting. Who have no energy left. No, these are the youngest of their crowds. They're coming in with their black hair, long black hair. Their limma, you know, their long black hair. And they're still being taken care of. So, to really appreciate this in Arabic, for those who understand Arabic, uh, the, the way the play on words is, he says, Al-Musdiri yil-bidu humran ba'dama waradat. He's using two juxtaposing terms, wurud and sudur. Wurud means for animals to be brought down to their water source. <coughs> Once they've drank, then they sudur, they go back. So you have wurud and you have sudur. And that's why you have al-wird. Uh, wird is a, a collection of du'as, a collection of adhkar that you do. Because it's like you're going to the source of the water, the spiritual water. That's why al-wird, uh, um, awrad, the awrad is plural of wird, al wird al a'zam. Then you have al bid. Bid means sparkling white, referring to their swords. Then he talks about humran, redness. That al musdiri means they would be returning their white swords after they've become red, after they have passed over the ida. Ida means the enemies. كُلَّ مُسْوَدِّمْ مِنَ limami, And even though these enemies were full black-haired young men. Limam is the plural of lum, limma. And limma is long hair. The one that goes beyond the earlobes. So that's what, he, that's what he's saying. So you've got white, bead. You've got muswad, black. You've got humr, which is red. So you've got all of these colors that are mentioned here as well. So it's just, in Arabic, of course, it sounds... Very interesting. Then he says, وَالْكَاتِبِينَ بِسُمْرِ الْخَطِّ مَا تَرَكَتْ أَقْلَامُهُمْ حَرْفَ جِسْمٍ غَيْرَ مُنْعَجِمِ He makes it sound effortless. He makes it sound like their spears were like pens in their hands. That they were just writing. Now when you write, you write what you want. You write as you want. Nobody forces you to write. Writing is a very personal kind of action. Where you write the thoughts of your mind. You write what you think. You dictate in your writing. So he's saying, by using that kind of resemblance to writing, he's showing how the war was so effortless for them. Allah had made it so easy for them. And of course, there's a lot of exaggeration here. There's no doubt. It's a poem. It's a praise. There's a lot of exaggeration here. So, wal katibin. Katibin, as you can understand, it comes from kitab. Katibin means those who write. Bisumri al-khatti. Sumr and khat. Now, number one, khat means lines it means and those lines make up letters uh, the, the letters are made up of lines you know so sumri al khatti ma tarakat aqlamuhum harfa jismin so he says sumr is rima which means spears and khat is a place in yamama from where they used to supply good um, spears from. A place called Khat, which is in Yamama. 
and they used to be brought down there from India because the Indian swords and spears were apparently the best. So it seems like it used to come to Khat, which was in Yamama, in the Arabian Peninsula, and then it would come from there. So now he's using the place name Khat, but he's appropriately using it as writing because Khat also means lines to write. Khat also means like a letter in a sense. So it's this play on the word Khat, that it's spears from that place called Khat, but also that they write. And maybe that's why it was called Khat to start with anyway. So Sumri al-Khatti, spears from the place called Khat, or khat, uh, Khatti spears, in other words. مَا تَرَكَتْ أَقْلَامُهُمْ حَرْفَ جِسْمٍ غَيْرَ مُنْعَجِمِ Like scribes whose pens from Khat, tracing with brown ink. I'm not sure. I think he's... The translation here is assuming that the sumr is the brownness. So he's taken it differently. Left no body devoid of point and vowels. That's how he translates it here. I would translate it somewhat differently. Because ما تركت أقلامهم Their pens did not leave. حرف jismin. Harf means the side or corner or edge of something. Harf jismin. so here it means the edge of any part of the body. غير منعجم غير منقوت Which means it did not leave it without it being dotted. Now you dot the I's and you cross the T's. So basically letters have dots. Although in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they did not use dots. Right? But here he's using the word غير منعجمي which means um, w- w- without dots. So that's, he, he's, he's using that term. What he's basically saying here is something very simple. He is saying that they used to bring their shiny white swords and they used to take them back red with the blood of the heads of the disbelievers. And then he says here that it is as though they're not this, he's already spoken about their swords, their spears used to be like pens by which they were writing on the bodies of their enemy as they wished, as they desired. So what does he mean by writing? The effect of the strike. So they were leaving, that was the wounds that they were creating. Now, I do want to ask us a question here, which is a very important question. We've been hearing about the stories of the Sahaba and their valor, and them killing the disbelievers. We've been reading those stories since young age. Parents used to read Fadail Amal, Hikayat al Sahaba, all of these stories to us, the Ta'aleem in the Masjid, that's what it's called. Now, did that ever make you think that you need to go out on the street and start killing people? All of these stories that we've been reading from a young age, the Sahaba's valor, them killing their enemies, the Battle of Badr, Uhud, all of these great battles where 70 of the leaders of the Quraysh are being killed and there's gruesome descriptions sometimes. Has it ever got any of our children even to get up and start beating somebody up outside? Like, Can you think of a single instance that that ever happened? Did that ever, was that ever a thought in your mind that this is... What I must be, I must be a Sahabi, I've heard these stories, I must go out and do the same thing. No, because the picture we're given of the Sahaba, along with these stories, are many, many other points. Of their character, of justice, of this happening under a proper system. So it's never led anybody to do that. That's why it's only in the last 5-10 years that we see the, the, the violence that's going on around the world in the name of Islam... Muslims killing other Muslims as well. We cannot say that it's from these stories at all. This qasida has been, been read for centuries. Never did anybody read these words and think, hey, let me go out and do that. This is what movies do to you. Because that's all artificial. It's all exaggerated. That's what these games do to you, these uh, computer games, you know, these, uh, these violent ones. They just get you so much into it. There's another, another reason that that is all happening. Because really, if you think back to all of these stories, I mean, we've been re- listening to these stories for years. Umar radiallahu anhu, Khalid bin Walid, 
Never did somebody say, I'm Khalid bin Walid, go and kill 10 people in the school, like they do in America. You know, last year it happened in Santa Barbara, that was the place where I used to live in America for eight years. Some guy who just thought that women don't like him. And he's a rich guy, he's got BMWs, etc. But he thinks girls don't like him. And the weird thing was that they were, they, they were all swooning over him after that. It was really weird. So he went out and killed a number of, you know, he went and killed a number of people. That's just desperation. So we're talking about really balanced individuals here. All of this is happening as a war that they had to fight for survival as a new fledgling religion that they had. But it was all, subhanAllah, it's never led our kids or us to, to do weird things because of that. So it's very important because, you know, we've been reading this for a few weeks now. And some newcomer who may be listening, you know, looking for some fitna, some problem, they're going to think, man, this is all violent. What is he trying to do? What's, he, what's going on? Subhanallah, these things have been read, read for centuries. It's never led people to go and do injustice because of it. Or violence because of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to understand these things fully and properly. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all insan with insaniya, humans with humanity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the true life of the sahaba. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم أنت السلام منك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث اللهم يا حنان يا منان لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم O oh Allah, accept our du'as. O oh Allah, accept our du'as. O oh Allah, allow this gathering of ours on these evenings to be of great benefit for us. O oh Allah, allow them to illuminate our lives, the lives of our children, lives of our communities. O oh Allah, allow these to be a means for us to be closer to you and your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for more love of your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come into our hearts and for us to be able to follow it. O oh Allah, give us the true understanding that your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam strove so hard to disseminate to us and to convey to us. O oh Allah, allow that to be a successful, a successful move from your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, we ask that you make us true followers of your Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You grant us his company in the hereafter and you make the best of days the day that we stand in front of you. سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله